get started, turning to chapter 19. Now, we've been working our way through the book of Revelation for some time. Some would say painfully working our way through the book of Revelation. And we've gotten up to chapter 19. And, in fact, we're moving into the conclusion of the book. Because uh, chapter 18 and 19 begin that conclusion. And we get into chapter 20 soon. That is the most controversial chapter in the book of Revelation. Because that's the chapter where we have the word millennium mentioned. And a lot of people define their eschatological position in terms of uh, the millennium. They're pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial. In fact, that word applies only to one chapter in the whole book. And for that reason, we define, uh, shared with you, a better way to define the positions uh, that one can hold in the book of Revelation as uh, futurist, uh, historist, idealist, or preterist. Uh, and we've discussed what those words mean. And, uh, but they, in essence, address all the other chapters in the book of Revelation, and therefore are more descriptive of the content of the book as a whole. But nevertheless, we're drawing close to chapter 20, and when we do, we'll discuss the millennial options. Chapter 19, verse 1. After these things, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, now, we've heard uh, and read phrases like this throughout the book of Revelation. In fact, we read one in chapter 11, verse 15. I think that particular uh, one is significant. Uh, verse 15 says, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the Lord has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Uh, and then the 24 el uh, elders who sit on the throne before God, they fell on their faces and worshipped God. In fact, we have the same thing in chapter 19. It, ap it appears from chapter 11 that the author John is saying, in some sense, with the seventh seal, we're going to bring it to an end. And the seventh seal has, in essence, come and gone. So we have now come to an end. And we hear concluding comments very similar. Uh, he goes on and says, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Now the great prostitute, of course, is a a key character or figure in the book of Revelation. We've identified that great prostitute as Jerusalem. And she's also called Babylon. And she's also called Egypt. And she's also called Sodom. And <coughs> in fact, there's a lot of ugly names <laughs> that are used to describe Jerusalem. And all these chapters up to this point were cycles of judgment on Jerusalem. And at this point, we were told in the past tense that she's been judged. It's done. It's over. Jerusalem lies in ruins in AD 70. Smoke uh, ascends up uh, before God. And uh, Jerusalem is, uh, biblical Jerusalem is no more. At which point, in verse 4 here, chapter 19, Excuse me. The smoke of her goes up forever and ever in verse 3. Now, I want to address that uh, forever and ever just a little bit. Uh, because uh, if you uh, think about it, you say, now, wait a minute. I've seen pictures of Jerusalem. I don't see any smoke. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so is it really going up forever and ever? What we're dealing here with is a extreme, you might even call wooden literalism, which is a 
really a form of language not common to humanity. People, you and I, don't talk that way. In fact, we're very flexible in our language. And, you know, if somebody uh, says, uh, are, you, are you going to come to the party? I says, yeah, I think I will. Uh, why? Well, everybody's going to be there. You shouldn't miss it. Well, who's everybody? Not everybody on the globe. It's a matter of interpretation as to what language means. Um, now, what is ascending up forever and ever? Certainly, the, uh, in terms of smoke, is the condition of hell. These people who were uh, defied God, were judged by God, were cast into hell because of their sin, that smoke ascends forever and ever, if you're looking for a literal interpretation. But in fact, it's very similar to the verse we read just uh, in verse uh, 20 of chapter 18. Um, excuse me, verse 21, chapter 18. So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. You know, say, wait a minute. Jerusalem exists. It was rebuilt. It's there. It, it is found again. So is that an error in Scripture? Well, I approach the Scripture for really from the point of view that it doesn't err. I err. I get confused. It doesn't. But what uh, is found no more is covenant, biblical Jerusalem. That's gone. What's that? Their sacrificial system is gone. The sacrificial system is gone. The covenant relationship with God is gone. Uh, it's been replaced by the church of Jesus Christ. It has come to an end. And it will never be again. And we talked about it in some detail last week, but just to remind you of that. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Again, there's a lot of similarities in chapter 11. For instance, verse 18 says, And the nations raged, but your wrath came, and the times of the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and for those who fear your name, there's the word fear, both small and great. And those are the terms we're, we're reading right here again, small and great, in this chapter. So there seems to be a repetition, as John was saying, as the seventh seal was about to occur, that this was going to end it all. Now that it has occurred, he's using the same terminology to say it's all over. Uh, the great prostitute has been judged, Babylon has been destroyed, and it is no more. This uh, section, verses 1 through 5 here, chapter 19, you could call it a summary of a summary. Chapter 18 being the summary we read last week. But if you think about it, these, these first four chap uh, verses are again summarizing what we just read in chapter 18. The author here has a hard time quitting. And he has a hard, I don't know if a hard time is the right word, but he reiterates the justice in the judgment uh, that, has, that has come. Verse 2, for his judgments are true and just. We've read that before. There is a reiteration to make the point, I suppose, humans being what they are, we might think, incorrectly so, Maybe God overdid it, you see, because you, we know from history what a horrible judgment this was in the destruction of Jerusalem. This three and a half year period from the edict by Nero to the actual destruction three and a half years later, this was a terrible period. I think uh, the Old Testament, maybe Daniel will have to check it out, called it Time of Jacob's Trouble. It was a terrible period in the history of Israel where about a million people died out of a you know, relatively small population, and, a, and not many survived, about 100,000. And all of those went into slavery and would, would be dead within a couple of years. Slavery was so uh, difficult, shall we say. And so this was a sad picture. 
And there is an attitude on the part of us people in which we, uh, you know, we, we express sorrow when we see people hurt and injured and such like. And uh, sometimes I think that if we're not careful, we're going to express an attitude in which we're more uh, compassionate than God. You see, God did all these terrible things. Isn't that terrible? No. The Bible is saying, no, that's not terrible. What he did was just and good and right. His judgments are true and just. And uh, what it boils down to is we've got to make sure that our fallen nature and, our, and all of its uh, qualities of our nature are in harmony with the teachings of Scripture. We're compassionate people, but our, our compassion has to be as defined by Scripture as to what we should be compassionate about. And, uh, and we, we hear uh, all, not all, you know, all through the church and outside the church that you know, we're not supposed to uh, uh, hate and things of that nature. And I give you... Uh, uh, you know, agree that that certainly is, uh, hate is a terrible thing, but we see God hating evil and calling us to do the same thing. So there's some sense in which we have to bring our thinking and our emotions into harmony with Scripture, and it's not always going to be easy because we're just not on the same page with God in our fallen nature. And so that we're going to have a hard time hating evil. We're going to be compassionate against evil. Uh, things of this nature. And so, if all we can do is delve into the Word and get the, uh, uh, you know, the plan, so to speak, and get on board with that plan and understand what God is doing, and when we don't quite understand it, understand it's just and it is good in the light of eternity. And now we've concluded this, the the summary and the conclusion of the conclusion and now we move on to some more material and uh, verse 6 says then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder now we've uh, heard phrases like this all through the book of Revelation in fact as I uh, quoted to you before, one author said, the book of Revelation is the noisiest book in the Bible. You know, I always hear anything crashing and crashing and loud voices and, and uh, mighty roars and things of this nature. And, uh, and it must have impacted on John considerably. He went out of the way to write this. Uh, like, uh, it's, it, it's not something he could avoid. It was so noticeable. The drama and the, the visuals and the uh, audio part as well. Uh, he tried to get it all down as it impacted him. And uh, they were crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord, our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen and right and pure. Now we've read about, we heard a sermon a little bit today about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And if you'll check your thinking, what is, uh, when does the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb take place in terms of what you've probably heard all your life? Does the answer come up? Well, it takes place at the end of time when we go to heaven. Where a lot of people think the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. But in fact, it takes place and has taken place in past tense. Uh, it, uh, right here in uh, this passage uh, 2,000 years ago. Christ's marriage supper doesn't occur 2,000 years after the marriage. It occurred when the marriage took place. Uh, which makes sense. And uh, let's uh, look at a few points about that. God has divided.
divorce Israel. That's a, a major theme of what I've been trying to teach. He's divorced Israel and Judah. And uh, we read that God uh, does things like this. For instance, in Isaiah 50, thus says the Lord, where is the certificate of divorce by which I have sent your mother away? Or to whom my creditors did I send you? Behold, you were sold for your iniquities and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. So we, we see that uh, the northern tribes uh, were divorced. And of course, the Judah, he's saying, I haven't divorced you yet. Uh, but uh, he's recognizing that the ten northern tribes were sold in the captivity for their iniquities and their transgressions, uh, <coughs> and uh, God di was divorced. A certificate of divorce uh, was issued, so to speak. I don't have all the verses here, but they're spelled out in Scripture. And uh, now, Judah is experiencing what the uh, ten northern tribes experience. Uh, first, one part of Israel, now the other part of Israel, uh, which has uh, proven itself to be full of iniquities and transgressions to the point where God cannot tolerate them anymore. With the uh, most significant of all transgression of all, the murder of Jesus Christ, culminating uh, in their, their history of evil. And even then, 40 years uh, was given for, for, for the uh, work of the apostles and the church to call Israel to repentance. And of course, many came to faith. But the majority of the nation did not. And so now, God is judging. He's closing the book on the unfaithful harlot which is his wife, and he is marrying another, the church of Jesus Christ. And so now we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. First note here, the marriage supper is supposed to take place when the marriage takes place. For the church, I began at Pentecost, and continues with each new soul added into the kingdom. So the marriage supper is not going to take place in the distant future. The marriage supper has taken place, and in fact, I would call what we... Uh, tend to go to the Lord's Supper, an ongoing uh, celebration of that marriage. Uh, as, as, in a sense, where the Old Testament feast, a similar celebration of uh, God's marriage to Israel. Second, Israel also wedded to, uh, was also wedded to Yahweh. The celebration of that wedding did not take place at the end of the relationship. But, it, but at the be, uh, beginning of the various feasts set aside by God for worship, very similar to our Lord's Supper, which is the marriage supper spoken of here. We have the wife of Yahweh spoken of in the Old Testament and the various feasts of celebration. And then we have the bride of Christ in the New Testament with the uh, New Testament feast. Third, our passage here brings us to the end of Yahweh's marriage to Israel through these divorce proceedings and the judgment of the unfaithful wife. The next step is God's marriage to the church. The new covenant and church age has been in transition for 40 years now. In coming as the Mosaic covenant and Judaic age has been passing away. There was, uh, they're, tip, they're typically found over and over and over again in scripture. There are 40 years of uh, trans. Uh, of, uh, Transition found in the scripture uh, often. Uh, one of which is most obvious is when Israel came out of Egypt and then 40 years in the wilderness of transition and making a nation out of this rabble, so to speak, and bringing them into the promised land, a fully formed uh, nation with armies and governments in place. Uh, so that's a, a common transitional period. Uh, and so, the marriage supper of the Lamb has uh, presented itself right here at this point in time in the early years of the Church of Jesus Christ. And I, I sort of think every believer through the last 2,000 years has participated in that marriage supper as they participate in the Lord's Supper. 
Any questions about that? This is a little bit different. I think in my mind, I, I don't know how, how specifically this has been spelled out to me in, in years past, but in my mind, I think I always had the opinion that one day, that, you know, the world will be passed and we're going to have this great marriage supper of the Lamb at the end of the time. <coughs> and when I began to study it, I realized, no, the marriage supper of the Lamb occurred right at the founding of the church, when the institution of the new covenant, when Christ broke bread and, of course, shared the wine. And that uh, was the beginning of this marriage to the church of Jesus Christ. And it continues. And, of course, there's a certain formalization of this that didn't take place until after the great prostitute was destroyed. And when the great prostitute was destroyed for her sins, then the point is made, now we have the formal inauguration of, of this marriage. A little bit different thinking. You may have to mull over that a bit. In verse 8 it says, For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the church. Or excuse me, of the saints. Righteous deeds of the saints. Now, this verse has, is, a, is a very controversial verse in the book of Revelation. Why do you think that is? What sounds controversial about that? We have righteous deeds. Huh? That we have righteous deeds. Okay. That's, that's hitting in and around, I think, the idea. I th doesn't it give a, 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 just a, look, a little look and feel of, of a work salvation? You know, that we earn our uh, righteousness. And, uh, and therefore, I, I, I'm sure that people that believe in a work salvation will twist this. I think you have to twist it. Uh, and to, to use this in such a way as to make the point that you have to earn your, your salvation. Uh, and that's why it's a controversial verse. However, um, I don't think that's the case. The righteous deeds that we do and we're preached about today are a product of our uh, positional righteousness in Christ. Righteousness, uh, the Greek word, the kasusune, is a legal term that means to declare righteous. It does not mean to make righteous in the sense that righteous is uh, a process that you can become if you do enough good works. That's not what the Greek word means. It is a legal term in which, in some sense, you might say you're declared, like you're declared not guilty in a court of law. Uh, so you're declared righteous. That happens the day you get saved. In fact, the day you get saved, there's probably very little righteous about you. <laughs> you say, But you're declared righteous. You stand before God positionally righteous in Christ Jesus. But, we're, but something is expected of us. You were listening this morning to the sermon. What's expected of us? We're expecting good works. They flow from this work of Christ in us. The work of Christ in us is his sovereign act in which he declares us righteous and his work of sanctification is he makes us righteous uh, uh, over, you know, or increasingly righteous over a, the, the period of our lifetime as we die to the flesh and live to Jesus Christ increasingly. Well, <clears throat> In that sense, I think we have here the righteous deeds of the saints. Uh, Christ has called us to good works. Good works we're incapable of if we are not first been regenerated by him. Having been regenerated and declared righteous, then we are called to prove it, to demonstrate it. There is no distinction in Scripture between Christ as Savior and Christ as Lord. Now, you will see that in some literature, very bad literature in the Christian church. Years ago, it was the whole thing going around called the Lordship Controversy, something to that name, some title like that. 
which simply meant some were teaching that Christ could be Savior, but not necessarily Lord. And, and that was somehow justified by some of these writings. Others who demanded that the, the, uh, Christ is Savior, Christ and Lord are you know, one and the same relationship to God. Those that are regenerated, as James makes clear, are expected to live out that uh, standing in righteousness. The Lordship of Christ, in other words, is a given to the believer, not simply an add-on, which may or may not happen. In fact, if it doesn't happen, Paul make, uh, uh, really makes the point of, uh, uh, of uh, searching your own soul to see that you, if you are indeed in Christ, because you know the works are missing. Works are testimony to uh, to this condition. They do not create that condition, but they are testimony to this condition. So the church is uh, the saints are uh, are uh, the final in it is the righteous deeds of the saints. We are expected to work. God empowers us to work and to do these things. And that which he empowers us to do, then he uh, provides us with uh, in terms of these uh, robes of righteousness. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Something changed right there in that sentence. What was it? From what we just read about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's not uncommon in Scripture to do this. Uh, we have a change of metaphor right in the middle of the paragraph. The first uh, discussion about the, uh, the bride of Christ is the church is the bride, and Christ is coming to the church. It's interesting, an important point, Christ is not coming <coughs> with the church in this passage. And you know, your dispensationalists teach that, you know, when Christ comes, he, he's coming with the church because the church has been raptured out of the earth for seven years. And then Christ comes back with the church. But in fact, in this coming of Christ, as discussed a little bit later in the book of, uh, uh, or this chapter 19, Christ comes back to the church, not with the church. The, the church, his bride, is waiting for him. Now that's an important distinction, one very difficult for uh, these others to get around because they're utterly insistent that Christ comes with the church. In fact, Christ comes to the church uh, in this passage. And uh, we have the church as the bride, and then we change the metaphor, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The first part where Christ comes to the church in the marriage supper, that is the church as a whole, collectively in vision. He changes his metaphor uh, to deal with individuals. We're each called to that marriage supper as guests. In fact, he uses the parable of this, Christ does, in the Gospels of which uh, he sends out his servants to invite his guests uh, to, to his banquet and of course, many refuse to come. And yet, he populates uh, this marriage supper in his parable with the, uh, by going into the highways and the byways and getting the halt, the lame, and the blind to fill his uh, marriage banquet. That's what God does when he saves sinners. He doesn't save the best of us. That's very encouraging, I guess, for us to know. He saves the worst of us. <laughs> you know? And so that's what he... He has done to populate this banquet. And blessed are those who have called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so the metaphor changes and us individually are identified here. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you. And your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus worship God. Now, it is common for people who call themselves the Christian to fall down at the feet of other people and other uh, uh, 
beings like angels or a special class of people uh, called saints. In fact, not only fall down and, and you know, show this great adoration and, and uh, kiss the feet of the angels or saints or not only statues, but human beings. Uh, that's, that's common in uh, Christianity. And you wonder why in the light of something like that. Where we are so clearly forbidden. Here is an angelic being whose existence in terms of power and glory would, must be, you know, a million times greater than any religious leader on the face of this earth. Refusing to accept anything like that. And yet a human being, which is a little, you know, peon of no significance, uh, just lapping it up, just loving it, you see, to be uh, virtually worshipped. You see, people bowing at his feet, things of this nature. So, that is not Christianity. In any type of uh, effort, you know, made to get the church to show adoration to angels and saints and uh, religious leaders, it's, it's just way misplaced in the form of scripture. Not too many years ago, there was a real, what well, I consider a rather questionable movement that went through the church, a virtual uh, angel adoration. We had multitudes of pictures of angels, those statues of angels. Oh, it was just an angel phase in the church. Do you remember it? Not too many years ago? Okay. I remember it. That's when you were a Baptist, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> pictures everywhere, you know, of stories about angels. I was really uncomfortable with that, um, you know, that attention given to angels. The angels don't want attention. You see, their, their focus is pointing to Christ. Here's an angel who has given attention, a real one, and, re and refused it. No, no, stop. This was a, a being of, like I said, immense power and glory. Wouldn't have it. So I think it's important for us to recognize that uh, we're called to worship God only and not religious entities and beings. Um, what questions do you have so far in this section on the marriage supper of the Lamb? Well, it's not really a question, but it seems to me that uh, when you, we put on the of Christ, we no longer uh, reject the gospel of Christ, which really qualifies us to, to be at the marriage supper. In the beginning. That's the only thing that qualifies us to be there. In fact, remember Christ's parable, there was one fellow there who came and he didn't have the proper robe, uh, proper garment, right. and he was cast into outer darkness, you see. And that garment... Um, and that's why this, this passage here it makes people uncomfortable, because we recognize that garment is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and we read here about you know, the righteous deeds of the saints, and there's a, there's a disconnect here. And uh, just a matter of understanding, those deeds flow from uh, the work of God in Christ. And uh, it's just a change of metaphors, uh, uh, and, and we don't want to be hung up so to speak, and not allow the scripture to change metaphors for its own purpose. One of, of course, the righteous garments of, of Jesus Christ, and uh, on the other hand, uh, through our life, we're expected to work for the Lord, and that work is praised by God. You know, he, he, he enables it, and then he rewards it. He enables us to do things which we couldn't and wouldn't do otherwise, and then having done it, he rewards us for it. Uh, there's something, <laughs> something uh, I don't know, strange about that, you know, in the sense that why would we get rewarded? If given a choice, we wouldn't do it, <laughs> you see. But in his grace, he, he subdues us to himself and, and, and calls us and empowers us to do things contrary to our flesh, and then we do it even to as little as giving a glass of cold water. Anything. Then he rewards us. Now, well, now, what am I getting a reward for that for? <laughs> you know, not that I'm complaining. <laughs> no, just curious why I got another reward. You know, he just is a great.
gracious God to reward us for that which he empowers us to do. It was Augustine who prayed, Lord, in essence, he said, call me to do whatever you care to, just empower me to do it. And it was Pelagius who heard that prayer and was appalled. He didn't think you needed extra power because you were good enough in your own merit to do it. And so began the Pelagian controversy. But Augustine recognized, first of all, you know, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. He's open hearted about it. But you understand, Lord, I'm not capable or even willing to do it in my flesh. So please empower me to do that which you've called me to do. Great prayer and uh, great controversy that came from it, which uh, still continues today in some 